Over 430 different board, card, and tabletop games and accessories were released and restocked this month, and we've compiled a list of suggestions of what's available right now, including our top picks, games that caught our attention, and a few wild cards. All that and more is coming up in this month's Board Game Buyer's Guide. Hey there, I'm Chaz Marler with Watch It Played, and this month's Board Game Buyer's Guide begins with 10 new releases and restocks that caught my attention, and why? It's this month's Eye Catchers. Now the first game that captured my curiosity this month is Caesar's Empire, a 2-5 player game about building roads for the glory of Rome set in the world of the comic series Asterix. As a member of Julius Caesar's entourage, players construct roads to connect Rome to new cities across the board. Each time a road is built, points are scored. Now additionally, every new city that's reached provides treasures that are worth bonus points at the end of the game. A Caesar's Empire is, reportedly, a re-implementation of the difficult-for-me-to-pronounce game from a few years ago, Drogi Duz Rizmu. And while this game may be based on that game, Caesar's Empire's table presence reminds me a bit of Through the Desert, even though Through the Desert is more about making routes to create subsections of a map, while Caesar's Empire is about making routes to connect points on a map instead. Though either way, it still looks like it's worth checking out. Speaking of games that reminded me of other ones, there's also Counter Attack, a football, well, European football, soccer to us Americans, strategy game in which two players each manage their own team of 11 players on and off the field. Every player at their disposal has a unique set of skills that the manager can utilize during matches. The managers control how the players move, pass, dribble, tackle, and shoot. Now, as I mentioned, Counter Attack reminded me of another football themed game, Eleven, the Football Manager board game, an economic strategy game in which players manage to grow a football club over the course of a season. However, that game is scheduled to be released by Portal Games later this year. So while we're waiting for Eleven to arrive, well, maybe scoring a copy of Counter Attack may be worth considering. But for now, let's turn from the world of sport to Factory 42, a Euro-style board game that puts players in charge of overseeing the work week of Marxist dwarves in a steampunk industrial factory. Now this is a cutthroat competitive game that also requires moments of cooperation, blending economics, fantasy, industry, and a little bit of negotiation. It's designed to play tightly, creating a wicked blend of shared ambition, but also sharp elbows to dodge. Now, this game stood out to me this month due to its quirky approach to theme and design, which its publisher describes as, quote, influenced by 1920s Soviet Union propaganda, fantasy literature, and elements of pre-World War I Prussian decor. Wow. Well, but Factory 42 wasn't the only game whose design caught my eye, which brings us to Glow, in which players are adventurers, building a company by recruiting a new traveling companion each turn, trying to combine their powers the best way possible. This is done, in part, by rolling dice to activate the advantages that those companions provide. But disadvantages that they provide can also be triggered. And while Glow is designed to be a game of card drafting, dice rolling, and calculating combinations, its graphic design and illustration is really what caught my eye about it this month. Its efficient use of color caused me to do a double take, and I am glad that I did, because you may find this tableau building dice management game worth a try, too. You might find this game to be a colorful experience as well, is what I was going to say, but I forgot, and I... And I I didn't say it, but then I did. Proud of me? And apparently it was a big month for minimalist art design, because the next game that caught my eye is Welcome to Sisyphus Corp, which introduces players as the most recent new hires at the infamous Sisyphus Corporation, where their goal will be to suck up to all three of their bosses before attending their annual performance review, which will earn them a coveted promotion. But be careful, as your fellow co-workers will do anything to prevent your professional progress. Welcome to Sisyphus Corp bills itself as able to be taught in about five minutes, but difficult to master with over 3.2 million different setup combinations. But even that is not what put this game on my list. Nor was the satirical twist on playing the right cards at the right time to claw one's way up the corporate ladder. No, 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 no. What I admire about this game is that here's a game that 
finally puts faceless corporations front and center where they belong, giving much deserved attention and admiration to the products and services that these corporations provide. Products not unlike the first one co-sponsoring this episode, yes it was a segue into the ad, Battle Bosses from Kesco, a competitive collectible battle game where bosses summon their minions and powerful effects to become the baddest boss in the multiverse. Battle Bosses puts players in control of a gigantic boss, managing dice to gain energy and crystal resources to unleash devastating moves, spawn minions to send into battle, and play innovative cards to gain a tactical advantage specific to each boss and its minions. At the beginning of each game, both players create a battlefield of tiles, put their boss in its starting spot, and draw five cards from their deck. And then, on their turns, dice can provide energy, crystals, or even a critical hit that results in extra dice and extra bonuses. Bosses employ strategies through tactical movement, creating minions, and unleashing their ultimate move at just the right time for total domination. Follow the link in this video's description to BattleBosses.com and become a champion of the ruckus! Today. Next up is Cleos, in which players compete for glory in the eyes of Zeus to be named the patron god of the rising Greek city state, Cleos. Now, this is a somewhat asymmetrical game of strategic combat and area control, combining hex based combat with tactical card play. Players summon minions, bestow blessings and curses, and bolster their allies with powerful upgrades. The feedback from players of Kleos that I found suggests that this game does incorporate a little bit of take that player interaction, and some of the game's moments can depend on having a little bit of luck. So the chaotic situations that this type of gameplay can result in definitely won't be for everybody. But if you are up for some gripping gameplay among the Greek gods, well then Kleos may be worth a look. But if riveting rounds of backstabbery just isn't your thing, well be sure not to pass by the game Moon Adventure, in which players work together as a team on a desperate mission to recover their supplies on the moon, where they have this adventure. Will the crew be able to survive the magnetic storms and limited oxygen supply to replenish their life support systems? I hope so, because I left my wallet in their rocket ship. Moon Adventure is based on another game called Deep Sea Adventure, in which players press their luck diving deep under the ocean waves to retrieve treasures before their oxygen tanks run dry. These adventure games are, are pretty easy to overlook, uh, not, not because of their quality, which is, is fine, but because they come in really tiny little boxes. I mean, seriously, here it is. I almost couldn't find it, but here, yep, boop, there it is. This is the size of Deep Sea Adventures box, and while Moon Adventures box is reportedly twice as big as this, ooh, that is still pretty small and is going to be easy to overlook. But do yourself a favor with these games, and if you missed them the first time around, definitely look again. Now let's switch from the tiny to the epically sprawling with Space Corp 2025-2300 AD, a fast playing board game in which one to four players explore and develop outermost space over the course of three eras of human development. And all before lunchtime. In the game, each player controls an Earth-based enterprise seeking to profit by driving the expansion of humanity deeper and deeper into the solar system by assembling spaceports, launching Mars missions, mining asteroids, mining exotic resources from planetary moons, exploring alien oceans, venturing to Alpha Centauri, and much more. This is an economic space exploration game based on a book series, which I hope that I can get into orbit around my own gaming table really, really soon. And from science fiction to historical non-fiction, next we have Soldiers and Postmen's Uniforms, a skirmish-level solitaire war game in which the player takes control of the valiant defenders of Polish Postal Office No. 1 in the free city of Danzig on the very first day of World War II. The defenders must fend off relentless attacks from the Danzig forces and two German SS units. Now, I believe that this game is based on the actual Battle of Westerplot, and it tells the story of post office personnel repulsing repeated assaults until they were forced, eventually, to surrender after enduring a day-long siege, after which the post office was doused with gasoline and set ablaze. So, as such, I don't think there's actually any way to win this game. Instead, the player's score is based on the number of non-combatants and postal workers that survive the attacks. 
It sounds like an interesting game, which is based on an equally interesting historical event in which postal workers were called upon to do much more than just deliver letters. And in the vein of delivering letters, I'm so sorry, we have not only the word game word heist, but also made a terribly awkward transition to, to get to this game. The goal in Word Heist is to create clever words that other players don't steal, while ideally snatching their words out from under their grasp. Each round, a number of different letter cards are shuffled and revealed, which the players will use to secretly write down their own heist word on their player board. Then, each player reveals a portion of the letters that their word contains. The more letters revealed, the more points they'll potentially score. But if this allows players to guess your word, then they might steal your points right out from under you. Now, I am always up for a clever word game, and Word Heist looks like one that requires not only some clever wordplay, but proper planning as well. So there we have 10 board game releases and restocks that caught my eye. And if they caught yours as well, well consider subscribing and enabling notifications so you don't miss out on any future suggestions that we have. In the meantime though, let's continue on to our next segment, What's in Store, where we check which games are actually on store shelves in search of some hidden gems. This episode, we visit my local Barnes & Noble, not a sponsor, which recently revamped their layout more than doubling the amount of space that they dedicate to tabletop games. So, does this increased floor space equate to a larger variety of board games in stock? Well, I desperately wanted to know. Well, when I walked into the department, the very first thing I noticed was, for better or worse, a lot, lot of Disney titles. So much Disney. You'd almost think that Disney wants to have a monopoly on the entertainment industry or something, as they literally do in the case of this first game, Monopoly Disney Villains, which is a reskinning of traditional Monopoly, but does add individual powers and several special abilities that players can claim. But of course, for those looking to experience the life of treachery as a Disney villain, there's also the appropriately named Disney Villainous, which I have talked about in previous episodes, which takes the concepts one might find in Monopoly Disney villains and ratchets them up to the next level. And not to be out scoundreled, there's now also Marvel Villainous, which pits players against each other as they step into the shoes of various comic book baddies from the House of Ideas. And that was just the tip of the iceberg, because the Disney brand also seeped into quite a few other modern titles as well, such as Marvel Splendor, which generally plays the same as original Splendor, but introduces a new endgame trigger, victory conditions, and a tile that can be passed between players throughout the game. And then of course there's Codenames Disney, which is a version of the award-winning game Codenames that exclusively features Disney characters on all of its clue cards, which actually can offer familiar ground to those who would like to introduce this fantastic group party game to players who may not actually be comfortable being fully immersed in modern board games. So hey, kudos for that. And let's mention one more Disney-themed game that I found before I naively try to get away from items that have been absorbed by the House of Mouse. This one being Disney Sidekicks, a cooperative game in which players take on the roles of one or more sidekicks from famous Disney films. They then battle villains, rescue villagers, collect locks, and rescue the heroes who have been captured by their arch nemeses. Additionally, each villain you can face is unique, creating the potential for a different challenge during every single gaming session. As for non-Disney items, well, it was really nice to see the current edition of Galaxy Trucker on the shelf, which was first published back in 2007. Games of Galaxy Trucker are split into two parts. First, players scramble to assemble a spaceship from a pool of parts, and then they go and fly it through the stars until it's smashed apart by various cosmic hazards. This new edition of the game features new art, more ship tiles, tweaked card effects, and streamlined gameplay. Another game on the shelves that I haven't mentioned in previous episodes is New York Zoo, in which players construct an animal park by creating animal enclosures, which is accomplished by properly placing puzzle-like tiles on each player's game board, and then playing other actions at the best possible time to end up with the largest animal population in your zoo. The oldest game that I found on this or perhaps any store shelf, is Uncle Wiggly, first published in 1916. This is a simple roll and spin or roll and move game in which players race along the board's track to be the first to arrive at the house of one Dr. Pottensworth J. Possum and win the game. 
Now, I was actually tempted to pick up a copy of Uncle Wiggily just to experience how much board gaming has evolved through modern times. In the comments, let me know if that's something you'd like to see. In the meantime, though, another pleasant surprise was finding Dune House Secrets on the shelf. This is a story-driven adventure game in which players take on the roles of rebels of Arrakis who must solve a series of challenging missions, each with a specific amount of time and resources at their disposal. Players cooperatively make decisions to steer the narrative in sometimes unexpected directions as they progress throughout the story, uncovering the secrets buried beneath the alien sands. And here's Star Wars X-Wing, a game that's been around since 2012, but this version is its second edition, which was introduced in 2018. And this edition was revised to offer players greater strategic depth, introduce new options for pilots that allow them to perform more dynamic actions at the cost of accumulating stress, and other options for linking actions together to really allow characters to push their limits in missions and interstellar dogfights. And then there's Things Shits Creek, which re-implements the game. I hope this doesn't get demonetized. The game of Things is what it re-implements, in which players read a topic card and then write down their response, which can be anything at all that comes to mind. The game emphasizes that there are no right or wrong answers. Then all the responses are read aloud and everyone has to figure out who said what. Plankton Rising was interesting because this is a variation of the game Thanos Rising from 2018, but this one, of course, is set deep under the ocean waves in Bikini Bottom. Now, Thanos Rising is a cooperative dice and card management game that I really enjoy, in which the players work together as Avengers to fight off Thanos and his minions to prevent the Mad Titan from collecting all the Infinity Gems. And I imagine that the Plankton Rising version here is based closely on its predecessor, but with an animated theme and characters. I wanted to also mention Games of Thrones Risk, which is the classic game of world domination with a Games of Thrones twist, plus an additional set of rules that introduces objectives, characters, and meister, meist, master cards. It has an E in it, but I think it's pronounced master or meister cards. There was such a wide breadth of games available that I'm going to need to break this trip up into at least two different episodes. So we're going to pause there and next episode we'll move on to the other side of this aisle to continue on with what's in store. But what's in store for us next is a new segment called Card Game Shuffle right after a word from the other sponsor that helped make this episode possible, Vivid Memories from Floodgate Games, the game that asks if you've ever imagined flying to the moon or venturing into an overgrown jungle or opening a candle store with the guy who played the janitor from Scrubs. In Vivid Memories, you'll collect fragments of childhood memories, weaving a tapestry of colored threads in your mind. Cleverly create connections and earn rewards for completing core memories, matching the imagination behind each moment, and working towards your lifelong aspirations for victory. Throughout their journey, players store important moments in their memory banks, gaining new abilities and new opportunities to score, all while working to collect fragments and moments that match what they aspire to be. Find the imagination in each moment by following the link in this video's description to find the game at physical and online stores and start building your own vivid memories. And now for a special segment called Card Game Shuffle, which I'm contractually obligated to say asks what the deal is with several card games, both new and old, that reached our retail rankings this month. Starting with Abandon All Artichokes, billed as being, quote, not your garden variety card game. Also, I did, I, I did not write that one that one either. In the game, players must prune their decks, that one was me, of any annoying artichokes by harvesting fresh vegetables, each with a special power that lets them swap, discard, or eliminate cards. This is a game that gets two green thumbs up for me, which is a joke that I am sure that nobody else has ever made about this game because I am oh so very original. But shuffling into the mix next is Crane Fractured Empire, a strategic deck building card game in which constructing a strong deck is the main focus of the game. The cards themselves provide a type of in-game currency called revenue, which allows players to purchase and upgrade cards, which they will then eventually use to overpower their opponents with relentless attacks. The game also features eight unique factions, each with its own strengths and unique talents, which players will recruit to assist them in their conquest. 
Also arriving this month was a restock of the classic Canisia card clasher, Battle Line, in which two opponents face off across a battle line in an attempt to win by taking five of nine flags across the field or three adjacent flags. Winning these flags is decided by placing cards in poker style hands on either side of them and then the side with the highest value formation of cards wins it. And battle Line is an updated version of a game called Shot and Totten, which updates a couple of things and introduces a set of tactics cards into the game as well. But Battle Line wasn't the only card game designed by Rainier Knizia that I saw for sale and would recommend this month. There was also High Society, in which the upper crust of society bids against each other to acquire various trappings of wealth while avoiding perilous pitfalls. But bidding on these accoutrements will need to be done wisely, because at the end of the game, the player with the least amount of money left is eliminated before the scores are even tallied. So spending wisely is definitely a must. And finally, I also stumbled across the card game Take That Towers, a tactical card game centered around dual-use cards with delayed effects. This is a game in which players build skyscrapers together by placing cards from their hand face up to construct floors and face down to stake their claim on the resulting real estate. Which sounds nice, until you remember they take that part of the game's name, because as the number of floors increase, so does the tension. And once a tower is completed, the effects of each floor will occur and the players will score points based on their arrangement. In the end, the player who scores the most points before the deck runs out, wins the game. And now it's this month's best bets. Retail releases with either a proven track record, rave reviews, or a little bit of both. If you're looking for a new hobby board game, then in my opinion, any one of the following is worth looking into. Let's start things off with the often difficult to find, seemingly continually out of print, two player masterpiece, Targi. A Targi consists of a five by five grid of cards, a border of 16 spaces with printed action symbols and then nine cards in the center depicting various goods and resources. Meeples are placed one at a time by the players on the spaces at the edges of the board and once all meeples are placed, players then execute the actions on the border cards that the meeples are on and also take the cards from the center that match where the meeples around the border intersect. Targi sets the standard for two-player worker placement games. So if that's the type of game that's on your wish list, but you, you haven't played it yet, we'll track this game down and try it out. Or if you're looking for a tale of teamwork and treachery, there's Sleeping Gods, in which up to four friends find themselves at the helm of a 1920s steamship lost in a strange world, working together to survive, explore exotic islands, meet new characters, and discover totems of the gods as their epic story unfolds over the course of a series of different gameplay chapters. The game centers around those totems, as finding at least 14 of them, scattered throughout the world, will be their key to returning home. And along the way, players will discover new lands, play through a campaign of stories, and overcome various challenges. And another cooperative experience that's topping this month's list is Old Tree, in which brave rangers must assist the people of their province, such as by rebuilding a fortress to ensure the safety and tranquility of those inhabitants. Along the way, the rangers will experience incidents, short scenes which provide the opportunity to win them fame. In the end, they'll reach the final chapter of the game's chronicle, which will end their tale. In order to have a happy ending, the players will have had to complete their assignments to the best of their abilities, lest the tales of their toils be lost as the kingdom continues to expand without them. Also expanding is the game Lost Ruins of Arnok, with its first expansion, Expedition Leaders. This new additional content gives players' expeditions an edge by allowing them to choose one of six unique leaders, each equipped with different abilities, skills, and starting decks that offer different strategies to explore. Additionally, this expansion contains alternative research tracks that provide more variety and challenges, new item and artifact cards to create more combos and synergies, more guardians and assistants to meet, and new sites to explore. In short, if you enjoy The Lost Ruins of Arnok, then I think that this expansion for it is a slam dunk. But the biggest slam dunk this month may be the game of influencing city development, 
Cape May, in which players traverse the city streets as entrepreneurs developing property while building wealth over the course of four different seasons. Build cottages, upgrade Victorian homes into historical landmarks, and establish shops by growing them into profitable businesses while moving around the city, strategically using activity cards to complete bonus goals and racking up the prestige that's going to be needed to go down in history as the most successful developer of Cape May. Now, th this month, several stores were also seen carrying a Vocations mini-expansion for Cape May, where players start the game by choosing their vocation, which allows them to activate a once-per-game benefit. This pack was originally given away to pre-order customers directly from the publisher Thunderworks Games. So, if you want to add a little bit of a boost to Cape May, then this Vocations mini-expansion may be worth keeping an eye out for, if you can still find it out in retail. And that is this month's Board Game Buyer's Guide. And to find even more of this month's most popular board, card, and tabletop games, we'll continue on to Momenten or one of the other fun and informative videos here on Watch It Played. Until next time, though, I've been Chaz Marler, and take care.